Chapter Thirteen, Domestic Training. Upon no account should the married's relation be entered upon until the parties have a knowledge of the duties of a practical domestic life. The wife should have culture of mind and manners that she may be qualified to rightly train the children that may be given her. Many ladies, accounted well educated, having graduated with honors at some institution of learning, are shamefully ignorant of the practical duties of life. They are destitute of the qualifications necessary for the proper regulation of the family, and hence. Essential to its happiness, they may talk of woman's elevated sphere and of her rights, yet they themselves fall far below the true sphere of a woman. It is the right of every daughter of Eve to have a thorough knowledge of household duties, to receive training in every department of domestic labor. Every young lady should be so educated that, if called to fill the position of wife and mother, She may preside as a queen in her own domain. She should be fully competent to guide and instruct her children, and to direct her servants, or if need be, to minister with her own hands to the wants of her household. It is her right to understand the mechanism of the human body, and the principles of hygiene, the matters of diet and dress, labor and recreation, and countless others. That intimately concern the well-being of her household. It is her right to obtain such a knowledge of the best methods of treating disease that she can care for her children in sickness, instead of leaving her precious treasures in the hands of strange nurses and physicians. The idea that ignorance of useful employment is an essential characteristic of the true gentleman or lady. Is contrary to the designs of God in the creation of man. Idleness is a sin, and ignorance of common duties is the result of folly, which after life will give ample occasion to bitterly regret. Young women think that it is menial to cook, and do other kinds of housework, and for this reason, many girls who marry and have the care of families have little idea of the duties devolving upon a wife and mother. It should be a law that young people should not get married unless they know how to care for the children that are brought into their family. They must know how to take care of this house that God has given them. Unless they understand in regard to the laws which God has established in their system, they cannot understand their duty to their God or themselves. The education which the young men and women who attend our colleges should receive in the home life is deserving of special attention. It is of great importance in the work of character building that students who attend our colleges be taught to take up the work that is appointed them, throwing off all inclination to sloth. They need to become familiar with the duties of daily life. They should be taught to do their domestic duties thoroughly and well, with as little noise and confusion as possible. Everything should be done decently. And in order, the kitchen and all other parts of the building should be kept sweet and clean. Books should be laid aside till their proper season, and no more study should be taken than can be attended to without neglecting the household duties. The study of books is not to engross the mind to the neglect of home duties upon which the comfort of the family depends. In the performance of these duties, careless. Neglectful, disorderly habits should be overcome, for unless corrected, these habits will be carried into every phase of life, and the life will be spoiled for usefulness. Many of the branches of study that consume the student's time are not essential to usefulness or happiness, but it is essential for every youth to have a thorough acquaintance with everyday duties. If need be, a young woman can dispense with the knowledge of French and algebra. Or even of the piano, but it is indispensable that she learn to make good bread, to fashion neatly fitting garments, and to perform efficiently the many duties that pertain to homemaking. 
To the health and happiness of the whole family, nothing is more vital than skill and intelligence on the part of the cook. By ill-prepared, unwholesome food, she may hinder and even ruin both the adult's usefulness and the child's development. Or by providing food adapted to the needs of the body and at the same time inviting and palatable, she can accomplish as much in the right as otherwise she accomplishes in the wrong direction. So in many ways, life's happiness is bound up with faithfulness in common duties. The principles of hygiene is applied to diet, exercise, the care of children, the treatment of the sick, and many like matters should be given much more attention than they ordinarily receive. In the study of hygiene, the earnest teacher will improve every opportunity to show the necessity of perfect cleanliness both in personal habits and in all one's surroundings. Teach the pupils that a healthful sleeping room, a thoroughly clean kitchen, and a tastefully arranged, wholesomely supplied table will go farther toward securing the happiness of the family and the regard of every sensible visitor than any amount of expensive furnishing in the drawing room that the life is more than meat and the body is more than raiment is a lesson no less needed now than when given by the divine teacher years ago. A young lady counseled to acquire habits of industry. You have peculiarities of character which need to be sternly disciplined and resolutely controlled before you can with any safety enter the marriage relation. Therefore, marriage should be put from your mind until you overcome the defects in your character, for you would not make a happy wife. You have neglected to educate yourself for systematic household labor. You have not seen the necessity of acquiring habits of industry. The habit of enjoying useful labor once formed will never be lost. You are then prepared to be placed in any circumstance in life and you will be fitted for the position. You will learn to love activity. If you enjoy useful labor, your mind will be occupied with your employment. You will not find time to indulge in dreamy fancies. Knowledge of useful labor will impart to your restless and dissatisfied mind energy, efficiency, and a becoming modest dignity, which will command respect. Many who consider it necessary for a son to be trained with reference to his own future maintenance seem to consider it entirely optional with herself whether or not their daughter is educated to be independent and self-supporting. She usually learns little at school which can be put to practical use in earning her daily bread and receiving no instruction at home in the mysteries of the kitchen and domestic life, she grows up utterly useless, a burden upon her parents. A woman who has been taught to take care of herself is also fitted to take care of others. She will never be a drug in the family or in society. When fortune frowns, there will be a place for her somewhere, a place where she can earn an honest living and assist those who are dependent upon her. Women should be trained to some business whereby she can gain a livelihood if necessary. Passing over other honorable employments, every girl should learn to take charge of the domestic affairs of home, should be a cook, a housekeeper, a seamstress. She should understand all those things which it is necessary that the mistress of a house should know, whether her family are rich or poor. Then if reverses come, she is prepared for any emergency. She is, in a manner, independent of circumstances. A knowledge of domestic duties is beyond price to every woman. There are families without number whose happiness is wrecked by the inefficiency of the wife and mother. It is not so important that our daughters learn painting, fancy work, music, or even cube root, or the figures of rhetoric 
as that they learn how to cut, make, and mend their own clothing or to prepare food in a wholesome and palatable manner. When a little girl is nine or ten years old, she should be required to take her regular share in household duties as she is able and should be held responsible for the manner in which she does her work. That was a wise father who, when asked what he intended to do with his daughters, replied, I intend to apprentice them to their excellent mother, that they may learn the art of improving time and be fitted to become wives and mothers, heads of families, and useful members of society. In early times, custom required the bridegroom, before the ratification of a marriage engagement, to pay a sum of money or its equivalent in other property, according to his circumstances, to the father of his wife. This was regarded as a safeguard to the marriage relation. Fathers did not think it safe to trust the happiness of their daughters to men who had not made provision for the support of a family. If they had not sufficient thrift or energy to manage business and acquire cattle or lands, it was feared that their life would prove worthless. But provision was made to test those who had nothing to pay for a wife. They were permitted to labor for the father whose daughter they loved, the length of time being regulated by the value of the dowry required. When the suitor was faithful in his services and proved in other respects worthy, he obtained the daughter as his wife, and generally the dowry which the father had received was given her at her marriage. The ancient custom, though sometimes abused, as by Laban, was productive of good results. When the suitor was required to render service to secure his bride, a hasty marriage was prevented and there was opportunity to test the depth of his affections as well as his ability to provide for a family. In our time, many evils result from pursuing an opposite course. No man is excusable for being without financial ability. Of many a man, it may be said, he is kind, amiable, generous, a good man, a Christian but he is not qualified to manage his own business. As far as the outlay of means is concerned, he is a mere child. He has not been brought up by his parents to understand and to practice the principles of self-support.